Well, I am going to end this subject, but you know what? I've been talking about grace ever since October. I think I began in October talking on the subject of grace, God's grace. And, um, you know, I'm going to end it today, but in reality, you can never end the message of grace because, as I mentioned in one of those messages before, grace is throughout the whole Bible. Grace is through from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. So no matter what we teach, whether it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, you're going to see the grace of God over and over again. But to be pinpointing that subject, I'm going to end that today. And I'm going to use the book of Acts as my main text this morning. Because as we see grace, and we, we are living in that uh, extension of the book of Acts, do you realize that you and I here in the 21st century, for over 2,000 years, we are an extension of the early church that began 2,000 years ago, nearly over 2,000 years ago. Amen. And so we're going to pick that up here in the book of Acts once again, in, the book, uh, in, in chapter 4. And, uh, and I'm going to just draw your attention here. Let's go to Acts chapter 4, and we're going to be going verse by verse once, once I begin. But I got to tell you, um, I got to tell you that when the early church, you know, Jesus, Jesus told his disciples, as we look at the numbers that were there, Jesus started with 12 disciples, of course, one checked out through suicide. But then the apostles, they added one back, so they were back at the number 12, which is a number of God's government. But what Jesus commanded all the followers to do, and you've got to remember, after his resurrection, the Bible says that he appeared to so many. A matter of fact, me and my brother were having a great discussion about this just the other day, and... and uh, he had appeared, according to what we read in the Word of God, to over 500, over 500 after the resurrection. And Jesus gave them this command. He says, wait in Jerusalem until the promise comes. And we find that even over after that over 500 that Jesus had appeared to, 120 were obedient. And 120 that were obedient were in the upper room praying and just seeking God, fasting in prayer. I'm sure they weren't watching Netflix. Amen. I'm sure they weren't scrolling through their phone, through Facebook. These were believers just seeking the heart of God, praying, God, you know, what do you have for us? What are we? We're just seeking you for whatever it is. 120 of them. And then the Bible says, on the day of Pentecost, the, whole, the promise of the Holy Spirit came like a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were. The Bible says that there was cloven tongues upon each of them as they began to speak in tongues, and tongues of the languages of people that were gathering from all over the, the known world at the time, that, that they were coming to Jerusalem for the festival. And they began to speak in tongues, and but God filled them with the power of the Holy Spirit and filled them in such a, with such a boldness on that day. And, and, and the Bible says that Peter got up and had to explain what was taking place as people were just curious, they were wondering, what is this all about? What they did here was the wonders of God. They, the people that were speaking in the known languages of that day to the hundreds, if not uh, to the thousands, I should say, that were there, they were speaking about the wonders of God. Peter got up and preached his message, and after giving that message, I'm sure that message wasn't very long. You could read it. It's recorded there in Acts chapter 2. And after he preached that message, the people cried out, and they said, what must we do to be saved? They were convicted in their heart. What must we do to be saved? And Peter looked at them and says, you need to repent from this wicked and perverse generation. You need to follow Jesus Christ. Pretty much it was the message of the gospel. It was the message of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus but the message was one of repentance, and the people repented. The Bible says that on that day, 3,000 souls came to know the Lord that day. 3,000 souls came to know the Lord that day. They were excited, and the Bible says they had all things in common, and they were, there was just a flow of God's grace taking place. And of course, persecution continued to uh, uh, just go after them, and they arrested Peter and John as they were preaching, teaching Jesus. They were teaching Jesus and, and the resurrection of Jesus, and so they arrested them. The church prayed. The church prayed, and, the, uh, and God released Peter and, and John, and, and the Bible says man, that, that those that prayed were just filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. That was a mighty move of God. 
And as they began, when they were preaching that out in the streets and all the people that were listening, the Bible says that there was another addition of not hundreds, but thousands that came to know the Lord. Now, if you were to look at it just by its face value, and this is one of the things that we can see, is that it looked like it was 5,000 more, but then I began to dig a little bit, and with the help of my brother, he, he was able to help me see that Scripture, and remember, we always say Scripture will interpret Scripture. So whether it was 8,000 now, or for sure we know it was 5,000. So let's just use the word 5,000 because now we have 2,000 more that came to know the Lord. The Bible says in that chapter 4 that now there's 5,000 followers, 5,120 followers that in the early church. And the early church had a lot to learn, a lot to grow because we know that Jesus Christ saved them, but there was a lot of discipleship that needed to go on. There was a lot of maturing and it just didn't happen overnight, but they were committed and they gave their heart to Christ and now they needed to learn. But in their hunger and in their excitement, they were just one thing that we see. And this is what we're going to pick it up in verse 32. One thing that God points out is that they were unified. They were unified in heart and soul. Now, when we think of the word unity, it's not, you know, you and I may have some differences. That doesn't mean we're not unified. And when I say there might be some differences, you might like a particular color. Your color may be blue. My color is green. You might like to drive a particular American car. I like to drive a Japanese car. So we have differences. You might like to dress a certain way. I like to mix it up. So we'll all have differences, and those differences is what makes us great and unique as we come together. Can somebody say amen? You might like the, new, the newest hair trends, and I just stick to just try to cover my ball spots. Amen. <laughs> so, you know, I look at those new hair trends, the way they, the men shave those sides and leave the long hair on the top, and I say, no, I need all. Uh, no, we're going to just do the comb over on me. Amen. And so what I'm sharing is, is it's okay when we have differences, but there's something about unity that we cannot be different in. We must be unified when it comes to the things of God. We must be unified when it comes to our loyalty, our commitment, our love for God. We must be unified in that respect. That's what's important to God. So let's pick it up here in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 32. <clears throat> Now the multitude is 5,120. Remember that number. The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. There it is. There's the unity. One heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things they possessed, that he possessed, was his own, but they had all things in common. When you look at the Word of God, and it says here, neither, now I'm reading out of the New King James, I'm not sure what your translation might read, but it says, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Here's my key point. I'm going to give you a school of thought. There may be two camps here of thought. But it says, neither did anyone say, anyone, any one of the 5,120 say that the things that he possessed was his own and they had all things in common. They realized in coming to Christ, they realized, and this is something that is, is a revelation of God and by the work of the Holy Spirit. This is something that we learn that as believers, and I hope you have gotten to this point in your walk, is that everything that you and I have it's really God's. He's only given us stewardship over them. Because when you and I pass away, when you and I die, we take nothing with us. No U-Hauls follow you to the graveyard. We take nothing with us. So everything we have belongs to God. 5,120 people realized that. And they said, we're willing to share this. We're willing to give this as that need arises. The Bible goes on to say in verse 33, and with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus 
And great grace was upon them all. Great grace was upon them all. You see, we've been talking about the subject of grace and we realize that the grace of God is that which God favors you with that you and I don't deserve. God says, as he gives us his mercy, his mercy is something that he removes judgment from us, but he gives grace upon that, following that mercy, amen? He has mercy upon us to forgive us of our sins and then he gives us grace and that grace tells me that he loved me enough even while I was still a sinner to save me, I was saved by grace. And by his grace through faith, he has imputed unto me the gifts that are not temporal, but the gifts that are eternal. Sometimes we look for the temporal gifts, no, and that's, my, that's the grace of God. Look what I got. Look what I'm driving. Look where I live. Look at this. Look what I'm wearing. No. The grace that God gives us is the grace of eternal life through His Son, Jesus Christ. The grace that we can have a living hope. The grace that we can have that no matter what happens in the world, I have a peace, a peace that transcends my understanding. I have a joy that doesn't come from the things that I get, but an inner joy that comes because of who Christ is in me. Amen. Amen. So I need to go down there and give my... Come on. Come on, somebody. Do you understand that the grace that God gives us is not temporal, but it is eternal? And when you think about what God gives us that man cannot touch, that man cannot take away, that which God gives in the eternal realm, do you realize it causes me to be motivated by his great love toward me to say thank you? Thank you, Jesus, for saving me, a wretch like me. That's why I love the old song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That's God's grace. So my life out of his grace that he showed to me is to honor him, to live for him, not to live for myself, but to live and honor him. Do I mess up? Absolutely, you and I mess up. But his grace forgives me. His grace dusts me off. His grace says, keep going. Do I want to sin intentionally? No. I'm sure you don't as well. But you see, when we understand his grace and we understand how great his grace is, then we worship him like this with open hands. And when we worship him like this with open hands, we really, under, by open hands, we say, nothing I have is mine. Everything is yours. And when we open our hands to him in worship like this, it's our way of saying, I surrender all. You, I hope we really mean that when we sing that song, I surrender all. But you see, that's God's grace to say, I love you that much to follow you and to live for you. That great grace was upon the early church. That great grace was upon them in the Bible. I love what it says. There was such a great grace because they understood what God did for them. And we understand what God has done for us. Can I hear an amen? amen. Let's continue on. Amen. In verse, 30, uh, verse 34. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold. Let's just... Oh, let, let, it, verse 35 ties in together with it. And they laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. Let's just stop right there. So when we look at the motivation of this great grace, the motivation of God's great love upon them, the Bible says they were willing to share what they had. They sold things that they had, whether it was land, whether it was houses, and they trusted the apostles to lay that before them, the proceeds of whatever that was, they laid it before the apostles' feet, and through that, the early church leadership at that time, they distributed amongst who had need. This is a really important passage for us. It shows the early church had confidence in the leadership of that church, of that new church. I praise God because this church and the members of this church have the, the confidence and the trust 
in how we use God's money in this church. Amen. If somebody was to say, well, you know, I just don't know. I just don't trust. I don't give to this church or any church if they're listening online. I don't give because I don't trust what the leadership does. I don't like what kind of car the pastor's driving. He's using my money. I don't like what they're doing with this, and that's why I don't give. You know what? Then find a church where you can trust them. I always say to somebody that says, you know, I don't give because I don't trust what they're going to do with my money. I say, well, then just give your money away. Give it to somebody out in the street that you know you have no idea what they're going to do with it. Give it to a single mom. Give it to a homeless. Give it to, just give it away. Test your heart. I always tell people, test your heart. It's not a matter of, oh, I don't want to give to that church or I don't want to give because you know as well as I do, it takes money to run a church just as much as it takes money to run your home. So sure, we need to use those monies, and that's why we have accountability of leadership so that we know how, that there's, those monies are used, being used properly. Amen. And there's an accountability for that. But I always tell people, listen, here's how you can test your heart. Whatever that is that is in your heart for a gift, let's just say it's a tithe. Let's say it's an offering. And, you know, God says, in the measure you give is how the measure will be given back to you. So if you want to just give away a couple bucks here and there, it's like then you'll live like that. But if you give out of generosity and you really have a good heart and you don't want to give to a church, I always say, test your heart and give it to the homeless. Give it to a single mom. Give it to a struggling family. Give it to somebody. And if it's that two, three hundred dollars, give it away. Four hundred dollars, give it away to somebody that you know you're not going to get anything back for it. And you know what? Most of the time they won't because it's really not about giving to the church, giving to God. It's really they just don't want to give it. This church was not like that. This church worshiped God, served God with open hands. The Bible says that they gave what they did, what they sold, whatever that was, they gave it willingly. None of them were ever forced. I want us to understand that. None of them were ever forced. They gave it willingly. No one took it from them. The disciples didn't say, we are forcing you to give this. You know, there are some religions and cults that they'll come after you if you're, if you're not regular on your tithe. Amen. <laughs> they'll knock on your door and say, hey, we noticed you didn't give last month. Where's the money? There really are religions like that that will go after you. The apostles didn't do that. They weren't forced because once you're forced and by government forcing you, what is that? That's communism. They take that away from you whether you like it or not and they just, they say, we'll take care. That's communism. And then if you use, what's socialism? Socialism is, we're going to take that away and we're going to distribute it amongst everybody so that everybody's equal. That's socialism. But what we find here is neither communism, not the start of it, not the start of socialism, because some have tried to equate this happening as a socialist type of a movement. No. You know, a great word for here, and it's right here in the Word of God, in verse, you probably never noticed this before, um, in that verse 30, uh, let me see, where is it here? Oh, in verse 32. In the end of verse 32, and it says, Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Say the word common. So what we have here was communism. You guys like that? Uh, I heard that, so it's not my original. Amen. So, but there's truth to that. Not communism, but it, communism. In other words, they didn't have to, but they wanted to give certain parts of maybe home sales, land sales, and they could have given whatever they wanted. It didn't have to be everything, whatever they sold it for. If they wanted to give part, it didn't matter. They just wanted to give because they knew there was a need during that time that there was those that were in need and they were able to share their wealth, they were able to share their offering, their gifts to the church and through that, what the church did, what the leaders did, what the apostles did, they were able to distribute it. And as they distributed it, they all experienced a great grace that took place. You know what we find here? The mark of a true believer is one who gives. 
Pastor Nathan was encouraging us to be givers. And every time we have an opportunity, they just encourage us, our pastors and leaders, they just encourage us to be givers. You know why? Because we understand the principle of giving. And God's word teaches us as we give, God gives us back. And sometimes it, gives, it may not come back monetarily either. But God gives, God provides, God will take care of us. But the, but the mark, listen very carefully, the mark of a true believer is one who gives. And it's not just giving of our money, but it's giving of our time, our talents, the gifts that, the, 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 the gifts that God has given you. When I say gifts and how he's wired you, how we can help others. And so when we see this, we see that that began to be in the early church, that they just gave their lives away. They were sensitive to the needs of others. They were generous because what they saw is that God was generous to them. How could God not have been generous to us? One of the most famous scriptures and one of the most popular scriptures that even the world knows is John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he what? That he gave. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God is a giver. And when we receive that gift of eternal life, when we receive the gift of Jesus, there should be something in us to say, I want to give. I want to learn to give. And like I said, it's not always about money. It's just I want to give my life away. I want to give as God gave me. Somebody say amen. Do you understand that? I, you know, I, I wish I could take credit for this, but I heard a quote, and uh, I wrote it down, and, and uh, let me just, uh, I want to say what the quote is. Some of you that are historians, you may know who said this. Here's what he said. You make a living by what you make. You make a life by what you give. Brother Ron, I was expecting you to have the answer on that one. Winston Churchill. He said... You make a living by what you make. You make a life by what you give. You see, the more we give, the more we can experience God's grace, the more we experience God's blessing. When, we, when God sees that there's a vessel that is willing to give, like I said, this is, not just, this is not about money. It's just about our life. When we learn to give our life away, do you realize that God just keeps pouring and you just experience Him more and more? I like... Pastor Nathan said this morning, man, the more you give, just, you know, it's just Jesus giving through you. Amen. The more you experience the intimacy of God, the more you experience the power of God, the anointing of God, because we just give our lives away. We just give it away. And when God sees a vessel that is just emptying himself, you think he's going to leave you empty. He's just going to keep filling you. And he'll fill you and fill you over and over so that there's this channel, this, this vessel that God can just pour into you and it flows out of you. Amen. So all we have to do is learn how to give our life away. And whatever that looks like. Like I said, it's not just about money. It's just about you. It might be you. You know, we know Jesus is coming soon. So why don't we just learn to give our life away and, and just try to get out of our shell, try to get out of our comfort zone and tell somebody, hey, can I tell you Jesus loves you? What are they going to do? They're going to hear you and they'll probably say, oh, Thank you, and then walk away. You'll never see him again. But something, God can do something with that. Something, God can do something with that. God did something with that with Stefan. I remember Brother Stefan, this testimony. He was the most wicked, derelict. <laughs> Seven, I'm talking about you. He was the most wicked derelict as a teenager. Am I right? But somebody yelled at him. Tell me, Stefan. Somebody was driving by. Tell, remind me. Somebody was driving by. Somebody shouted out at you out in the street, passing by, by car, right? Some radical Christian, whoever, I don't know who it was. You don't know who it was. And what did they yell at you, Stefan? God loves you. Stefan's return, and I got to tell you, his response back, I can't repeat those words. It'll be bleeped left and right. But he cussed at them, right, Stefan? He cussed at them left and right as they drove away, blankety, 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 blank. But God did something with that. God loves you in Stefan's heart. It just dwelled and dwelled and dwelled 
and dwelled. And then one day, Stephen finally surrendered. I mean, it was like the Holy Spirit wasn't leaving him alone. And one day, he just finally said, okay, what do I need to do to get saved and experience this love of God? You don't know. That's, that's giving your life away just by saying that. This has nothing to do with money. It's giving our life away, whatever that looks like. It might be to give money away to somebody at the market and you, 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 the, the Lord just says, pay for their groceries. It might be somebody that says, give them a $50 bill or whatever, a $20 bill, a $5 bill. Whatever it is, be sensitive to give your life away. It could be money. It could be your time. It could be where you need to sit with an elderly or go to a nursing home or somebody that feels so lost and rejected, isolated, and nobody cares about them. And then just for them to hear your heart and you to tell them about Jesus, tell them about your life, but more importantly, tell them about Jesus. You don't know where that's going to go, but that's giving our lives away. Oh, the Lord, we, we can go on and on and on. But all I'm saying is that the mark, what we see here in this early church, that the mark of these true believers is they learn how to give their life away. Can somebody say amen? Amen. 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 So let's pick it up. Let's continue. Verse 36. And Joseph, in other translations, it may say Joseph, depending on how you're reading. And if you're Latino, you might say Jose. <laughs> and, and, or Jose's. <laughs> Come on, somebody, lighten up, man. I need somebody to kind of... But we know him as Barnabas because it says, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite from the country of Cyprus. Having land, he sold it, and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, why did they have to single out just one guy? Here we saw earlier that the early church was experiencing such tremendous sharing and commonality just given there but then all of a sudden we get this guy barnabas that there, that there's recognition there's there's something about this man well i did a little profile search on him and i found out that this man yes the reason why they called him a son of encouragement is because he had a heart to reach he was he had an evangelist heart he had a missionary's heart he went on paul he went on one of paul's first missionary's journeys this man paul, barnabas you can read about him in acts chapter 11 don't go there now but here's what i found and, and acts chapter 11 tells you the, his character because it's it identifies us as a good man full of the holy spirit and faith and when we look at his life he was a teacher he was an encourager whether it was in small groups or whether it was on one on one he was able to be recognized at that but i truly believe he was a man of humility he wasn't a man that i'm going to do this so that somebody can recognize me i truly believe and i know that the bible says let somebody else praise you don't go praising yourself that's what the book of proverbs says it says let somebody else praise you if there's going to be praise let somebody else do that don't try patting yourself on the back it's kind of hard <laughs> oh i can't do my left arm amen but you gotta right let somebody else give you praise but when somebody gives you praise just say you know what it's god all the glory to god i really i really believe that barnabas was that kind of a man as we see his character the bible says he was a levite he was of the priesthood but he wasn't he wasn't serving in the priest the bible says that somewhere his family moved him to cyprus he was out of cyprus but yet we see here they acknowledged him because i truly believe that he gave of his life, whether it was that which he sold, and he presented that at the apostles' feet because he had the heart to want to be of an encourager. Let's pick it up in chapter 5. Now, chapter 5, there's a break here, but it really isn't a break because the word begins with, but a certain man. But a certain man named Ananias, with his wife, with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession... And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. So I don't know with 5,120 early believers if word got out about Barnabas. Perhaps because it's mentioned here, perhaps Barnabas' name became very well known during this early church time. But I don't really believe he did it 
with the motivation of recognition. But somehow, Ananias and Sapphira heard about this. News travels. And as they heard about this, perhaps in their heart, Satan conceived and said, you know, you can be just as noticed, just as recognizable, just as popular as Barnabas. Why don't you sell what you got? And why don't you say that we're going to bring everything? You see, Satan has a way of lying that sounds pretty good. I remember when I went into the ministry and, and the Lord uh, put in my heart to, um, to leave my job and to just live by faith. I, I was working for the post office at that time. It was a good job. This was back in the 80s, in the eight, uh, late 80s. Uh, early 80s, I'm sorry. Actually, it was the end of 87, but the, so I was really seeking the Lord because I didn't li really leave until February of 88, but God was already dealing with me prior to that in 87. 80, uh, 87. And, um, and I said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and quit. And then the devil used someone to, one of my friends, colleagues, one of the, the, actually he was the union president, he said, we need to have a talk. And so as I shared my heart with him and what I was, the intentions I was going to do, he says, no, you can't do that. He says, who's going to pay the bills? Who's going to take care of your family? And I said, I want to live by faith. He said, well, faith don't pay the bills. I said, well, God's going to help me. You, you know, he says, uh, tell him I'm busy. Uh, <laughs> he says, faith don't pay the bills. And I said, I said, well, um, he said to me, why don't you just take a leave of absence? Take a leave of absence for two years, see if it works out. If it doesn't work out, you know, you can come back to your job. You see how the enemy works? And so I said, well, you know, that don't sound like a bad idea. It's kind of a safety net. And so I just continued to work and, and continued to just, I figured, okay, I'll just go to HR and let them know I'm just going to put a leave of absence in for a couple of years and uh, we'll see where this goes. Well, the Lord immediately, because the enemy planted this thought, the Lord immediately acted. It's, it was like a chess game. You know, Satan makes a move, God makes a move. Amen. And God used a preacher on, the, on a cassette, a preacher that says, and you young preachers that are thinking, of, you know, he's preaching his testimony, I'm listening to his testimony. And he says, you young preachers that are thinking about going into the ministry, how dare you think you're going to launch off and have a rope tied to the shore? He says, you better cut that line and you better t totally trust God or don't even do it. I said, wow. And this guy, he had no idea, but that's what God uses whatever ways and techniques he wants to use, amen? Even cassettes. You guys remember cassettes? And so I just quit, and God's been faithful ever since. What I'm trying to say is this, is that perhaps this kind of thinking thought, this conception within Ananias and Sapphira's heart, they both agreed to do this. This is an early church. It says that they kept back part of the proceeds, and his wife was in on it. And then they came and they presented a portion to the apostles' feet. Verse 3. But Peter said to Ananias, it's like if it, we know that it's the Holy Spirit that put this word of knowledge in Peter. Peter had no idea, but God revealed it to him. The Holy Spirit revealed it to him and says, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. 5,120. 
I'm just using that number. Could have been 5,120. I don't know what that number was, but I'm just using that number because that's where we started. Great fear came upon all those, and I looked up that word fear. You know, when you look at that word fear, I was hoping it was a good fear. A good fear meaning great fear came upon the church. A great fear of the fear of God, a fear of... There's, there's two Greek words for fear, and I, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it correctly, but one of them is phobeos, uh, something along those lines. And that means it's an awe fear, a reverent fear. It's the kind of the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord, that's the fear that we should have to reverence Him, to awe Him, to be in His presence. That, that's a good fear. But this is not that kind of fear. The Greek word here is phobos, where we get the word phobia, phobos. And that fear is a terror fear, a dreadful fear, a frightened fear. The Bible says that's the kind of fear that gripped the church in that day. And that just goes to show us that God doesn't want sin in the church. God does not want us to ta tangle or to embrace or to play with sin. And I think we've lost that, that type of a fear. Jesus even said, don't fear the one that can't hurt, that can just hurt your body. Fear the one that can hurt your body and throw you into hell. That's the fear. That's the Phobos fear. I think we lost that kind of fear. I mean, we would love to, we, we'd love to say, oh, I have a fear for God, a fear of love, a fear of reverence. I reverence. But I think we lost the fear of, like, what can God do to me? Well, that great fear, that Phobos fear, it gripped the church. Because God does not want his church to embrace sin. And Satan will do, and he's not going to ever stop. He's going to continue to try to entangle us in sin. And I know that we're not sinless in the respect of, but you see, when we intentionally know and we still want to sin, you better watch out. Don't mess with God. And we as parents, we've got to understand that what we practice, what we allow within our homes, listen very carefully, what we allow in our homes, that, that whatever those practices are, we're passing that on to our children. They're watching us. They're watching us. Are we real or not at home? We can be one way in the church, but how are we at home? You know what I love about this story? is that as we get ready to read the next verse, watch what happens. So let's read verse 3 one more time. And Peter, Peter says to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Ananias, after hearing these words, he fell down. He breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young man, verse 6, the young man arose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Verse 7. Now about three hours later, when his wife came in, not knowing what happened, somebody say, not knowing what happened, that's key. That's key. This wife, Sapphira, three hours later, not knowing what happened. You know what that tells me? 5,120 were not gossiping. <laughs> they weren't saying anything. Think about it. This man dies. Peter says, why are you lying to God? Boom, he drops dead. They carry him out. Three hours pass. Do you think that those young men may have told somebody or somebody would have told somebody, did you hear what happened? Did you hear what happened to Ananias? Did you hear? Three hours later, I mean, they said, oh, man. These believers in the early church, they said, we're not going to mess with God. They didn't go and tell anybody. They didn't say, they didn't start calling. They didn't start Facebooking. They didn't start texting. They didn't start passing on the communication, going from house to house. Did you hear what happened? Did you hear what happened? That's a great church. That's a great church. Amen. 
nobody gossiping. The woman comes, his wife Sapphira comes, three hours later comes to Peter. Peter says, and this is where I really believe God could have had mercy on this woman. He says, Peter, <clears throat> verse 8, and Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last, and the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her out, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband, and then here we hear that again, verse 11. So great fear came upon the church and upon all who heard these things. I, I, you know, it would have been nice if when Peter says, tell me, did you sell the land for this much? If she would have said, no, my husband lied. It was only for this much. I really believe she would have been alive. You know what I really see? And you, you don't have to agree with this or not. You do not have to agree with this because this is where we're going to get into two camps here. I personally don't believe Ananias and Sapphira were saved. They may have been in the mix of the church, but I personally don't agree with me. I personally don't believe they were saved. You know why? The only reason why I say that is because when we read the beginning of the story, it says that all the believers were together with one heart and soul. They were together in unity. This couple wasn't together in unity. I'm remembering the words of Jesus in Matthew, the seventh chapter, I believe at verse 21. Jesus is in the day of judgment. Jesus is talking to people who were church people. And uh, he says, matter of fact, let me just quote it correctly. In Matthew chapter 7, he says in verse 21, and I, I think it's chapter 7. Yes, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. There will be a day for those that may say, well, Lord, didn't I go to church and didn't I volunteer and didn't I help in this area and didn't I do this and didn't I do that? And Jesus will say, I never knew you. So you can't not know Jesus for him to say, or else that would make him a liar, for him to say, I never knew you. You don't have to agree with me or it's Okay. We can have this difference here. I personally don't believe that Ananias and Sapphira were saved. They didn't have the same heart as the other believers. They were in it for themselves. They were in it for their own recognition, their own prestige, whatever that looks like. They were in it for the reason of, for them, they were in it for the reasons of themselves. And you know what's, interesting is that sometimes we can here's the bottom line and I'm going to end with this all God wants us to be is genuine and real we all fall short we all fall short there's not one of us in here that is flawless can I hear an amen, amen. not one of us not one of us and God knows that there are things that we still need work on. And for some of you, like Stefan, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. <laughs> I'm picking on him today, amen. Amen. <laughs> there's a lot of us that, you know, we still have issues in our lives that God still has. The Holy Spirit has to still work. All God asks is that we are real. And not pretend to be somebody we're not or not pretend like if, oh, we got it all together. You know why? Because 
Jesus came against those. You know that you realize that he did not come against the woman that was cut in adultery. They probably brought her. I'm hoping that when they ripped her out of the bed sleeping with that man, I'm hoping that the Bible doesn't give us the details. She could have either been there on that ground ready to be stoned naked or maybe on the time where they apprehended her and drug her before Jesus that she was able to grab a sheet perhaps. I would hope that she was at least in her sheet, sh sheet, in her sheet, covering herself, even though she was in shame. But Jesus didn't condemn her. Jesus said, as he told those of you that are without sin, throw the first stone. They all walked away. Jesus says, I don't condemn you either woman, but I want you to go and sin no more. She didn't say, oh, no, I didn't do it. I'm not, I'm not an adulterer. She, didn't say, she knew she was, and she was honest with it. Just like the woman at the well, when Jesus went to see the woman at the well, you know, she just tried to say, you know, hey, you know, who are you? And they're just getting to know each other. Jesus reads her mail. He knows exactly who she is, about, about the five husbands, and the one you're with is not your husband. She didn't say, no, it's not, Lord. No, it's not. She didn't lie. She realized He's right. I did, have, I did sleep with five men. I am, I am with a man that's not my husband. I know. You're right. All God wants us to be is honest. That's all he wants us to be is truth. You cannot lie to God. You and I cannot lie to God. We cannot be, and I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but this is what I think what happens a lot in churches today. Oh, hey. How you doing, brother? Oh, how you doing, brother Larry? Brother Larry? Uh, yeah, man, everything's fine. And I just beat up my wife. Oh, everything's fine. And I just was viewing pornography. Oh, everything's fine. And I'm still taking drugs. Oh, everything's fine. And I'm still drinking on the side because I can't quit my, 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 my alcohol. Oh, everything's fine. You see that? Jesus condemned people with masks. And the people he condemned were those that tried to portray themselves as, oh, I got it all together. I'm good with God. You know who they were? They were the hypocrites. They were the religious leaders of that day. And Jesus said, you hypocrite, you're just a, you're a dead man. You're stinky. And yet you're trying to portray yourself as you're somebody good on the outside. But on the inside, you're dead and you stink. And that's who he condemned. He condemned those who were hypocrites. God just says, take the mask off. Be real with each other. If there's still a struggle in your life, let us know. The book of Galatians tells us in chapter 6, verse 1, it says if you see a brother in, in, in struggling with sin, help him overcome that. Let us help you. Let's help one another. That's true love. You know what it really comes down to? It always comes down to an agape love. A love that says, listen, I know you may be struggling or I may be struggling. Can you help me? Instead of putting on the mask. I put those uh, eyebrows there because I always hope that I can grow mine back. <laughs> See, I'm being honest with you. I have no eyebrows, man. I'm mad at you guys that have all them hairy eyebrows. Amen. So, <laughs> God just wants us to be real. I really believe that if Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira, because he told Peter, told him, he says. You know, you sold it for 100000 and you wanted to keep 50000 You could have done that. God, it's not about the money. It's about being truthful. It's about being honest. It's about being genuine. Ananias could have been alive to this day. His wife could have been alive, but they were together. Some may say, well, well maybe she just submitted. You know, the Bible says, after all, husband, wives, submit to your husbands. You know, wives, if you have unsaved husbands... Don't submit to the sin they want you to do. That's something you do not have to submit to. And vice versa. If you, husbands, if you have an unsaved wife. We don't submit to someone else's sin, even if it is our spouse. We've got to honor God. And God will get you through that. But here's the bottom line. And I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. Amen. I'm done. I really believe that you know, today's church, today's Christian culture can be very hypocritical only because I, I don't know, and I, I know that I can't judge this, and only God can, 
But there may be today, because there is such an easy believism, just to say this prayer, and if you say this prayer, you'll be saved. Well, we know that there is a prayer to pray. There is a prayer of confession. There is a prayer of contrition. And that's the key. The key is, it's not a matter of what you pray. It's a matter of the condition of our heart. And if our heart is broken and contrite, that's the heart the Bible says that God will not turn away. That's the heart that when we cry out and say, God, I am a sinner, that's the heart that's sincere. The heart that says, I've sinned. And I'm struggling to sin. God honors that prayer and God can change your heart. God can change your life. God can save you. If you're a sinner, it's not enough just to go to church. It's not enough just to say and sing all the songs and say, hi, brother, hi, sister. But it's the, it's the person who is broken in spirit and crying out to God for repent in repentance for salvation. And in that, that's the heart that's saved. That's the life that's saved. Lord, this morning before we end, as we humble our hearts before you today, even before we take communion, Lord, let us examine our hearts and Holy Spirit put the spotlight on each and every one of us. We do not want to lie to you. We know there are consequences. Lord, it seems like it was pretty harsh back then, but we know that, Lord, you, you hate sin and we can't embrace it. We can't practice it as believers. We know we fall short, Lord, but we want to be honest and sincere and true. And if there is sin in our lives, Lord, right now, we want to repent of that and we want to ask you to forgive us. We want to ask you, Lord, to cleanse us because when we take communion, Lord, we want to come up with a clean heart and a, and pure, hand, a pure heart and clean hands, as the Word of God says. Who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? but he who has a pure heart and clean hands. So right now, Lord, we ask you to... And Lord, I want to give this opportunity for every single person here today to ask you for forgiveness, to ask you to cleanse us, to ask you to pur purify us. Because I believe, Lord, there are many here we love you, and there might be somebody here that doesn't know you. And maybe you've been tugging on their heart for already a long time. And perhaps there's somebody here that's in a backslidden condition. But your agape love is here. It's flowing. Your agape love wants to embrace them just like the prodigal son, the prodigal daughter, Lord. And I just use daughter. But Father, I pray that someone here today that's in a backslidden condition can come back to their senses and say, I want to repent and I want to come back to Jesus. I want them to know, Lord, that this church, just like you, will not reject them. But just like you, we will accept them and embrace them in a spirit of repentance, in a spirit of humility. So, Lord, as we get ready to come forward, I pray that right now, as we give them this moment, that their hearts can just line up with you and allow you, by your spirit right now, to touch them forgive them, cleanse them. I want you to let that be your prayer. That's between you and God right now. Let that be your prayer. Let that be your heart as you pray right where you are. Jesus is listening to you. Jesus loves you. Jesus, Jesus' his forgiveness is available for you right now. All you have to do is receive him. Receive it. His love, his forgiveness. And let him embrace you once again. And for us, Lord, God, we pray that we can remove mask and we can be honest with you, Lord God. I want you to just take this opportunity to remove that, that spiritual mask. If there's a mask on you, just take it off. Take that mask off. And God, can't hide, we, we can't hide anything from God. He knows. Just like he told Adam and Eve in the garden, where are you? Where are you? Let's just acknowledge that. Not try to hide and not try to cover our shame. Just be honest. Just say, Lord, I'm here. And I need your help on this area. Would you just begin to present that area? 
that area that you're struggling with, whatever it is, for everyone, it may be something different here today. I just mentioned a few things. I'm, only the Holy Spirit can reveal to you things that God wants you to repent of and to change and get rid of. Whatever that is, whatever that looks like, it could be different for everyone. I want you to, as you give that to him, now I want you to receive his forgiveness. You see, this is all by faith. This is not something you have to feel. You just have to trust him and, and by faith receive his forgiveness. Because he's our living hope and that's the way we live each day. And like I said earlier, what's important to God is that spirit of unity that we're all together in what is more important than anything. And that is the unity of the spirit, our commitment, our loyalty, and our love for God and his word. That's what's valuable to God. Thank you, Lord. Now I want you to begin, as you receive that by faith, now I just want you to say thank you, Jesus. Once you just begin to give him praise, would you just begin to say thank you, Lord, and with a heart of gratitude by faith, saying, Lord, I want to thank you for hearing my heart this morning. I want to thank you for forgiving me. I want to thank you, Lord, for just giving me another opportunity, Lord, to draw closer to you. And I don't want to listen to the lies of the devil anymore where he, he makes me think that I'm not worthy. Lord, you made me worthy because of your righteousness I want to listen to your heart, Lord God, that you, you draw me, draw me close to you, Lord God. And Father, let me feel your presence here today. And I'm going to believe that as I get ready to walk forward to re be reminded of why I'm here and why I worship you, Lord, because of what the sacrifice that you did for me in saving me because of the cross where you shed your blood for me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Can somebody say amen? Our ushers are ready to serve us. Amen. As, they, as we sing that song again, the living hope. Amen. I'm going to ask you just to come down any aisle you want. After you received your, 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 your cup and your bread, would you just all stand up in the front? And like I always say, if you're comfortable and you want to not be close to anyone, feel free to get your cup and your bread and you can go back to your seat. Amen. So what, whatever you're comfortable with, we're going to give you that freedom. Amen. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name.
with her. your hands right now but I I think your hearts are probably exploding amen all because of Jesus he is our living hope we do this in remembrance of him because of what he has done for us we always do this you realize that the church has been doing this for two over 2,000 years when believers gather whether it's in a setting like this or in a home or wherever outdoors it doesn't matter Jesus said every time you do this you're gonna do this in remembrance of what I've done for you and this is a tangible way to remember how Jesus' body was broken for us, mutilated for us, and what he went through for us. And then his blood that he shed on Calvary, the cross. Never get away from the message of the cross. It's all about the cross. And so we remember that. Lord, we humbly stand before you today. And as we come to the Father's table, thank you for the bread and the cup. And just like we're reminded of what you did on that upper room on that, that evening before you were arrested. You knew what you were going to go through. And you gave, this, you gave this ordinance for us, this commandment for us to follow. Just to remember tangibly what you went through for us. And so you took the bread when you broke it and you prayed and you said, this is my body which is broken for you. And you said, do this in remembrance of me. And you pass that bread around. Well, we have that bread. Unleavened bread without spot or blemish. No leaven, no sin. And this re represents you, Lord. So we take this in honor of you in a good fear, the fear of reverence, the fear of awe, the fear of gratitude, of worship. So we want to say thank you for the bread reminding us what you went through for us on the cross. Let's take the bread. And then Jesus took the cup and he blessed the cup and he said to the disciples and he says to us as his disciples today, this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. And every time you drink this, you do this in remembrance of me. For the blood that he shed on Calvary. Now we can say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the blood that never lost its power. The blood that still flows to cleanse us and to forgive us. The blood that is, will always be eternal. We thank you, Lord, that this represents that which you have done for us at Calvary. Let's partake of the cup. Thank you, Lord. Now in your heart of worship, no one moving around, and just hold on to your cups. We'll disperse of the cups in a little while. Would you just, just offer a thanks and worship to him? Take this. We're, we're not in a hurry this morning. One of the things that the Lord reminded us is giving our lives away. And giving our lives away, like I said, is something that we can do every day. Because he gave us his very best. I really believe that we can give our best back to him by giving our lives to others. 
whether it's the one another here or whether it's within our community. And so I'm going to just pray this prayer. Lord, when we learn how to give our lives away, Father, we know that you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna do something with and how we do this. We may not fully understand it, but Lord, imagine if we were that community like what we read about 2,000 years ago where God, we just, just gave our lives away. Whether it's in our neighborhood, whether it's at the marketplace, whether it's, Lord, within the church, the body, or whether it's with complete strangers. Lord, would you just renew in us the spirit of evangelism, the spirit of reaching out and what that looks like in your love, with your love, to give our lives away just like the early church. And we pray, Lord, that as we do this, we're going to see the fruit of it. We're going to see the manifestations and how you work and what happens to us. I really believe that for our church, Lord. So, Father, I just pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Can somebody say amen? amen. You know, there's a song that before we leave, can we sing it? It's, it's an old song. We haven't sang it in years. And it just simply says, I give my life away. Can we just sing that before? Let's just not move quite yet. It just goes like this. Give myself, myself away. away. That's all it is. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. Let that be your prayer this morning. I give myself away so you can use me. Sing it again. I give myself away. myself away so you can use me away to someone this week. Amen. Just let the Holy Spirit lead you. Just be sensitive as you pray and as you seek God every day in your walk. You watch what he does. The other day I was walking as I walked my dog and you know this is where you just got to be sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit and it may not be to everybody but you'll know. So I'm walking my dog the other day in the neighborhood that I live in and I usually walk the outer circles because my whole neighborhood's in circles 
And um, as I'm walking, and I only have maybe about a mile left or thereabouts before I head back home, I saw a man out in his driveway drinking a cup of coffee. And as he was drinking, I passed by. And, you know, like neighborly, you would just say, hey, how you doing? And you just say hi, and you just keep walking. And I usually listen with headphones on, but my headphones don't cover my ears. They're those other kind that just sit outside. And so I'm just worshiping the Lord as I'm walking. So then I'm singing songs, whatever it is. And um, all of a sudden, I'm about a house away, a house lengths away. And the Lord just put on my heart, go back and tell him I love him. And so I said, okay. So I turned around, and I turned my headphone off, and as I walked back to his house, I said, I walked up to him, and he had his cup of coffee in his hand, and I said, you know, I said, my name's Larry, and he goes, hi, my name is Eddie. And I says, you know, I just want you to know that God told me to tell you he loves you, Eddie. And he said, what, the, the next thing he said, what church you go to? I didn't tell him who I was. He said, what church you go to? And I said, I go to a church called Agape over by Central High School. He says, I don't know where that's at. Me and my wife just recently moved here. He says, you have a card on you? Man, wouldn't you know it? I'm totally unprepared. <laughs> Didn't have nothing. I says, I'll bring you one tomorrow. Well, that, mar that tomorrow was a Wednesday. And normally, I'm here earlier on Wednesday. And so uh, I took it to him on Thursday morning. And he says, I was looking for you yesterday. So I gave him the card. And I don't know if he'll ever visit. He may. You'll know if you introduce yourself and you say, hey, what's your name? And he says, Eddie, you'll know that's the guy. <laughs> and uh, I just wanted to share that to you because God can do that in all of you. Just be sensitive. You know, you don't, I'm not saying you have to go around telling everybody unless you really, if you got the heart of evangelist, you probably will be telling everybody. But just be sensitive to the way the Lord leads you. And then step out of that comfort zone and tell somebody that God loves them. Jesus, don't be afraid to use the word Jesus. Jesus loves you. Amen.